All right. All right. Um, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Welcome to the SOLA seminar. Today we have a research topic by Hugh Campbell, uh, Chair in Sociology at uh, University of Otago. Um, he is going to talk to us today about farming and decolonization, three absent narratives. So I'll leave it to you, um, Hugh. Yeah, uh, thank you for the welcome and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to uh, the solar seminar today. Uh, it's it's a big topic, but I think one that uh, is uh, both uh, enormously important for where we are as a country. And uh, it's really I really appreciate the chance to come and speak from my particular positioning on this. Right, so today's talk, I want to talk, I want to go through what I, I think we're experiencing in terms of the decolonial moment uh, in New Zealand scholarship, research, and as a wider society. And I want to set up the premise that while we're teetering on the brink of being able to start to talk about what would uh, decolonization or decoloniality, as the theorists like to say, of farming in New Zealand look like, uh, there are three silences we have to address. And so the majority of today's talk is really about what I consider to be the three key silences that we're coming up against. Uh, and then once those things have been cleared away, we can start to talk about uh, what, what uh, the nature of decolonization would look like once we're through those silences. So starting with the decolonial moment, I would argue that there are currently two journeys that are underway for scholars in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, and, and across much wider society as well. The first is the journey to recognise that we are a country that is inextricably shaped by colonisation. And I think it's fair to say that that journey is now well advanced. We're making, we're making a lot of progress. We're moving a long way into uh, how to understand and how to shape and how to begin to be scholars and researchers and how to be uh, and how to act in political ways around the, uh, the understanding of the colonization of New Zealand and what decolonization um, might mean. But the second journey, the journey to recognize the role that farming played in the colonization of our land and how that influences that colonization and the legacy effects it has left us influence the challenges we face today. I, I would argue that's a journey that has really just barely begun. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to what I think that journey is looking like and where I think it, some of the things that are going to take us in particular directions. So let me start with some historians. You have to start with Sir Keith Sinclair. Uh, in terms of the big beasts of the jungle that have wandered New Zealand history in the 20th century, there are a few that are bigger than Sir Keith Sinclair. He wrote the first definitive history of New Zealand. He wrote the first book of what he titled The Maori Wars. And he really was the architect and, and, the, and the signifier of a, of a, of a histor historical movement called cultural nationalism. The idea that New Zealand as a colony was becoming a better version of Britain. And his version of decolonization was that we are cutting the apron strings with Britain and becoming a proud and independent and incredibly successful country. Uh, among his many claims to bolster the fact that we were probably probably the best country in the uh, there was no doubt in Sinclair's mind, we were the best country in the world. Uh, we were the, the, one of the most egalitarian British settled countries in the world. We had to quote Sinclair, the best race relations in the world. Uh, and uh, we were, yes, we were generally superb. In terms of the big beasts of the forest, here comes Jamie Ballard, who many of us would remember from his New Zealand Wars television series some decades ago. But Ballard's entire career has really been aimed at deconstructing Sir Keith Sinclair's incredibly optimistic vision of the colonization of New Zealand and its resulting in a wonderful, better Britain. Uh, Bellich completely reinterpreted the New Zealand wars and, and the loss of land, but for me, he leaves an enormous silence uh, in his work. And that is that Bellich, by his own admission, is a little bit allergic to farming. He didn't like the prominence of farming in Sir Keith Sinclair's narrative of how amazing we were as a country. And uh, so he um, he really tried to write a history in which he steered around everything, everything else but farming. If we're going to go down a decolonial journey into farming, though, if we're going to move beyond the kinds of figures like Sir Keith Sinclair and James Ballach, who have uh, been the ones who've imprinted a particular kind of 20th century history on New Zealand, 
I think you have to start with confronting the devastation of political, cultural and ecological worlds that happened in New Zealand. And we have to fully recognise uh, the role that farming played in those colonising processes. It wasn't always so. Uh, so the way in which I have uh, journeyed into this particular world uh, comes through an explanation of the many branches of my own family's history. I come from a long line. I, I have six lines of uh, colonial descent that come from Pakeha family farms that were established in New Zealand. And the very first one of them was this one, a farm in, in, the, upper Waiha, in the upper Waipa called uh, Maratahe, which was the farm of Dennett Heather, my great great grandfather, and his second wife, uh, a Maori woman called Unaiki Tawatarohi. And together they had this farm, uh, and this farm turns out to be, this farm both exemplifies um, the way in which a particular Maori and Pakeha farming world was emerging, particularly in the first uh, decades after the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, and was emerging in incredibly cooperative and productive ways. And this farm I, I, I've written about uh, recently as being one of the places where there was a massive colonial pivot. This was the farm where literally, literally General Cameron's troops invading up the Upper Waipa to try and uh, extinguish uh, the Kingitanga camped beside this farm. And it was off this farm that they launched their flanking move that would end later in the day with the massacre at Rangiafia. Uh, so this is the kind of farm that me that sort of sits at a pivot in New Zealand colonial history, a time of enormous complexity and collaboration and many possible futures after that day in 1863, begin to converge on a much more destructive and Pakeha dominated uh, colonizing by farms and uh, the, the progressive and in the end quite severe marginalization of Maori off their farming estate. So this, of course, many of you will recognize this. This is the uh, Waitangi Tribunal's land loss maps that are oft talked about and uh, really show the extent to which Maori farmland uh, was alienated in the period leading up to World War II. In the South Island, the map is a little less interesting. It all went in a couple of chunks. Now, I'm not the first person to consider this particular history, by no means. I mean, I'm, I'm walking in the footsteps of some very important historical accounts of uh, the role of farming and land loss in the colonization of New Zealand, none greater than Sir Hugh Kafaru's um, benchmark work, Maori land tenure. Uh, I think I want to uh, give a shout out too to the work of the uh, particular group of researchers uh, led by Eric Pawson and Tom Brooking, who wrote the initial environmental histories of New Zealand in 2003, and then more recently, Empires of Grass in 2011, our two first major texts on the environmental history of New Zealand. And also uh, the collection, I think the very important collection by uh, Sir Hugh's daughter, Merita Kafaru, um, about Fenua. Uh, which included some very interesting moments in that book reflecting back on what had happened in terms of Maori land use in New Zealand and Maori farming. Um, for geographers, if there's any geographers in the room, you would you would recognise the uh, sort of the patriarch of uh, the discipline of geography in New Zealand, Sir Kenneth Cumberland, uh, who in 1941, when he was writing uh, as part of a collection discussing the centennial of the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, said you know, that the story of New Zealand is, is not yet well understood uh, internationally, how remarkably different we are and how rapidly everything has happened in New Zealand, particularly in terms of the transformation of our landscape. So in his famous quote, what happened in New Zealand happened in only 100 years. The same level of landscape transformation took four centuries in North America and 20 centuries in Europe. That landscape transformation I can find in my own family's farms. So I was uh, in terms of digging back into the most the earliest possible photographs. The earliest photograph I have of one of the family farms is the Campbell Farm on Glen Road in Kaupokanui in South Taranaki in the 1880s. And this is a photograph that uh, a lovely artist of my acquaintance uh, re-rendered in pen and ink to make it, it was a little bit uh, dodgy to reproduce just as a photograph in a book. And there you see our farm uh, that particular first great Campbell farm in the Taranaki, uh, and the pastures are still lumpy. The bush was only burned out comparatively recently. The grass sward is only just starting to absorb tree trunks and the like. And the farm is nestling into a block of bush. There's a little sawmill at the back here where the palings are piling up here. There's still a lot of scrubby land. 
come back in a, another family photo we have from only a decade later, and you see that the Kaupokanui farm is quite transformed. The pasture sward is established, the, teen the, the children are now teenagers, there's a lot of fencing battens, and the bush is gone. This is becoming something of a more recognisable Pākehā family farm in that place. And by the 1920s, the subsequent farms to that will, will simply wryly comment occasionally if they're ploughing very deep, that they start ploughing up lines of charcoal from the burnt bush that our farms were created on the top of. This transition uh, is eloquently told recently by the um, recently departed and much missed uh, Emeritus Peter Emeritus Professor Peter Holland from the University of Otago's Geography Program, uh, who wrote in his uh, lovely book in 2013, Home in the Howling Wilderness, about a huge transition that took place in New Zealand farming through the last decades of the 1800s as we moved away from learning and asking and collaborating quite strongly with Māori, particularly for environmental knowledge in terms of how to make our farms work, through to an increasing convergence on a, of a modern scientific Pākehā farm where Māori were progressively excluded and delegitimised. That story, of course, as all of you will know, is told uh, most poignantly in Herbert Guthrie Smith's uh, epic farm autobiography, Tutira. Uh, nowhere more profoundly in that great preface to the final edition of Tutira that Guthrie Smith wrote only weeks before he died, uh, just at the start of World War II, uh, in which he, he looks back and laments all that he has achieved is, is, is really something to turn to dust emotionally for him. And he, and he reflects back on the great journey of his farm that he's chronicled in Tutira and asking whether all that land improvement, you know, have I merely just desecrated God's earth and called it improvement? Have I simply participated in eroding away our hillsides into the Pacific Ocean and leading to the hastening of the of the death of all the native plants and animals that used to dwell on this land? It's Herbert Guthrie Smith's lament is one of the most poignant moments in the decolonial journey of farming in New Zealand. He is something of a lone voice, however. So we've reached that decolonial moment. The, the, the scaffolding is in place. Uh, there are some really important histories uh, written about the nature of farming in New Zealand and farming colonisation. Uh, but it is, I, I would say, to really take root or to, or to flourish, we need to confront these three silences. We need to address the silence of the strange absence of an authoritative Maori farm history in the 20th century. We need to confront the enormous silences that are created by the mythologizing of the Pākehā family farm in the 20th century. And we need to create these strange and multifarious ontological silencings that come from the creation of the modernist farm. Those are the three prequels we must address before we can come to the decolonization question. So let's start with silence one. Very interesting, as I was thinking about this talk, to be listening to Kim Hill, and there she was uh, interviewing Sir Tiffany O'Regan last Saturday um, on RNZ. And to paraphrase much of what Sir Tiffany, I didn't agree actually with everything Sir Tiffany said, but to paraphrase a very interesting insight about the nature of his, the, the historical narrative coloni of colonisation in New Zealand. Um, he, he really pointed out that our history and our writing of history and our understanding of history went through a process of what he called ethnic cleansing in the 1960s. So there was a lot of stuff that had been talked about in history, but, it, but the complex, ambiguous or unfortunate material just got airbrushed out of our history in the 1960s, along with the Maori. Uh, that's why in his terms, the 1970s fight back was so important because Maori were about to be completely erased. Um, it's an interesting way to think about the colonization of New Zealand because, I mean, the simple way to think about colonization is just we came, we were we were thuggish British settlers, we despoiled the environment, uh, we engaged in a series of unjust military en engagements, we confiscated, we did bad things, uh, but slowly, you know, things got better. We, we learned to accommodate and live with each other. And through the 20th century, we all progressed and things eventually got modern. As Sir Tiffany points out, there's actually two phases in the colonization of New Zealand. There's the brute stuff that happened in the 1800s through into the early decades of the 1900s. But then there's a second phase in the middle of the 20th century when the whole historical narrative starts to get shaped and molded and airbrushed and a whole lot of a veil drawn out of over a whole lot of things that people were much happier talking about in the 1920s or 30s. 
It's a mysterious process, and it's central to this telling of the story of Maori farming in the 20th century, or the not telling of it. Um, it's also the central, it's the essential prequel to Dame Finna Cooper setting out in her hikawa in the early 70s under the slogan, not one more acre of Maori land will be lost. So the missing voice uh, in Maori history, there is a lot written about colonization and the land. There's a lot written about sovereignty, about the treaty, about the negotiation, the loss and regaining of rights. Uh, there's a lot written, particularly uh, research through the Waitangi Tribunal about land loss at a macro level. Uh, there's much written uh, by historians of politics about initiatives undertaken by the likes of leading politicians, Sir Apirana Ngata and his modernization movement in the 1920s. And there's a number of Maori biographies like Ngata's that include farming narratives. But there's very, very little on actual Maori farming, and it's a curious and, and, and it's a really perplexing silence. And, and really, so really sitting between two anthropologists, uh, this one here, uh, Elsden Best, whose book Maori Agriculture was written in 1925, but he's a traditional anthropologist. He was writing about Maori agriculture as pre-modern Maori agriculture. Everything Maori had done before they began to be modernized. He wasn't writing about Maori agriculture in the 1920s. And rolling right through to what was really the the voice of Pat Hohepper in 1964 and his study of a Northland community, which included some discussion of their farming world. Uh, do you start to, and Hohepper was a very, very uh, lonely voice in the 1960s, very lonely voice. You get this mysterious absence of discussion of Maori history, Maori farm history. That's not to say there wasn't a lot of discussion of it. There is enormous discussion of Maori farming being done by Pākehā because the 1950s and 1960s see the, the constellation of what had started out in the 20th century as the Maori land question by the 1950s and 60s has become, in the Pākehā narrative, the Maori land problem. And when you read back through archives, through Hansard, through all sorts of publications of the moment, through brochures and pamphlets, there's some really, really common and commonly reproduced themes uh, around what becomes known as the Maori land problem. They roll, the, here are the key themes. Maori land is unproductive. Maori land must be understood as being merely wasteland. Maori farmers are cognitively unsuited to the rigors of modern farming or scientific farming. That Maori are ungratefully resisting assimilation into the modern world. That Maori land is uncredit worthy and cannot be lent to by banks because it has abnormal ownership. It doesn't have a single private owner, it has multiple owners. Uh, there's complaints by all sorts of people that Maori land has improper or vague boundaries. I'll come back to that one later. And there's a call that comes from politicians across the political spectrum, right through to high court judges uh, and various other government uh, agencies, arguing that Maori in the 1960s are on their last chance to modernise, uh, and that they've been given their last chance, and if they don't, the government should step in and simply confiscate the remaining land so that it should be brought into virtuous productive use. Hence Dame Finner's slogan, not one more acre of land shall be taken because it was a very, very real prospect at the time. There was strong political and ideological impetus to simply go and grab the remaining land. So here we have some of the, I'll just read you some quotes out here. Charles Goldsmith, a close ally of Sir Apirana Ngata and the grandfather of Paul Goldsmith, there are many, in a speech he gave to the Department of Agriculture on the East Coast in the late 1950s, there are many quite successful Maori farmers, and it's significant that most are of mixed extraction. It is that pit of Pākehā blood in him that prods the Maori. His farming ability must evolve with his character, his education, his appreciation of the finer things of life and of values. He is by nature happy-go-lucky. He needs ambition to spur him on, and that generally comes with an injection of Pākehā blood. It is a foregone conclusion that the Maori will in, dim, in the dim future be absorbed into the white race. By that time, the solution to his land problems may come to light. Not pretty. Part of the great purge that Sir Tiffany was talking about in the 1960s with the Department of Maori Affairs managed to get rid of nearly all their actual Maori bureaucrats and replace them with much more scientific and rational Pākehā bureaucrats. And this is a brochure that was produced um, by the Mar Department of Maori Affairs with the cooperation of the Department of Education. 
about the problem of educating Māori to, to farm. They, Pākehās, Pākehās, always seem to assume that the Māori really knew perfectly well how to plan his farm ahead, that he refused to plan purely out of naughtiness. But any teacher of Māori's where the children of adults will know that his ability to make long-range plans and carry them out is especially difficult to develop. Māori's will work for a long-range objective only if they are carefully trained to do so. Only among a minority is this ability um, aimed at as part of the parental training of children, nor do many teachers succeed in inculcating it into their pupils. Much of the problem here resides around the Hun report, the benchmark report written in 1961 about the state of life for Māori in New Zealand, uh, which whilst it was shocking at the time for revealing uh, much about uh, the parlous state of Māori, despite Sir Keith Sinclair's claims we had the best race relations in the world, the Hun report really exposed the incredibly precarious uh, nature of Māori, the level of poverty, the level of disadvantage and vulnerability experienced by Māori communities. But Hun uh, saw no solution to this in Māori retaining their farmland. The attitude of the government is expressed clearly. Everybody's land is nobody's land. That ensured is the story of Māori land today. Multiple ownership obstructs utilisation. So Māori land quite commonly lies in the rough or grazes a few animals apathetically, while a multitude of owners rest happily on their proprietary rights, small as they are. If Māoris are unwilling or unable to achieve these results under present conditions of ownership, the conditions of ownership should be changed and transfer into European hands should be made easier, if necessary, to achieve full land utilisation in farming terms. So, if Māori farming history, it adds up to a fairly ugly picture, and I think that it's one that, um, yes, when we build upon the glories of New many of New Zealand's mid 20th century uh, achievements, uh, particularly some of the uh, um, the nostalgic glorifying of New Zealand far farming's great achievements in the 50s, 60s and 70s. We forget that this came part and parcel with this particularly, patri it's, a, it's a form of, it's not vicious racism, it's patronising racism that was institutionalised and just embedded across government and Pakia society. So if Māori farming history, this is our first silence, if Māori farming history doesn't exist for the 20th century, it's because Māori farmers were derided, their land was subjected to scorn, and their contribution was measured by the extent to which they learned to mimic Pākehā. Silence one. Moving on to silence two, the mythologising of the Pākehā family farm. Slightly more fun stuff in here, if slightly cringeworthy. So Sir Keith Sinclair in writing that kind of history of the golden age of New Zealand in the mid 20th century, if he'd lionised the family farm as a key contributor to our national status as a better Britain, the story went something like this. Our farmers were wonderful because our farms were efficient and scientific. They were the backbone of the nation. They had the best agricultural science in the world. They were a massive economic success. Producing uh, in 1952, over 90% of New Zealand's foreign exchange revenue was achieved not just from farming, but from pastoral farming. And this had been achieved, according to Sinclair, whilst maintaining our extraordinarily egalitarian uh, class structure in society. And that farms, of course, according to Sinclair, were foundational to virtuous and close-knit rural communities. So even in the um, even in the official histories of the time of the time, uh, there is this enormous mythologization of the virtue of the Pākehā farm. That, that spanned over quite uh, happily into the realm of popular culture. Um, I would want to just uh, acknowledge uh, my colleague in sociology at the University of Canterbury, Alison Loveridge, who's done a wonderful study of over 150 farm autobiographies, which were just this incredibly popular genre of literature in New Zealand. And as Alison Loveridge points out, are both jolly jaunty tales, but they have remarkable thematic similarities. And one of those thematic similarities seems to be that farming in New Zealand starts in the 1920s. It's very hard to get some of the big high country uh, places go deeper than that, although the, their history was pretty scratchy before then. But there's a sense in which farming starts in the 20s. There are virtually no Maori present in these biographies at all, uh, unless they arrive as shearing gangs or scrub cutters. 
uh, and there's very strongly defined gender roles. Um, heroic farm men uh, and women face adversity created by mother nature. They face down an enormous ecological catastrophe without ever ironically realize, uh, admitting that was the catastrophe that they caused themselves with their own transformation of the landscape. Very thematically similar. Uh, Mary Scott's novels, The Breakfast at Six series, uh, were huge bestsellers in New Zealand um, based on the story of a, a new a soldier settlement block uh, farm in the King Country. And Essie Summers was one of our most highly published authors, not, not making her name into the, the list of the Montana Book Awards or anything, but Essie Summers was our most famous Mills and Boone writer. And, um, and, and, and the, the key thematic in all her Mills and Boone stories was, there is going to be a troubled sheep farmer somewhere in need of a wife. History, popular culture, but on in terms of our personal family narratives, what I grew up with uh, as the descendant of multiple lines of farming families were these incredibly important colonial narratives. So for us, our narrative did go back to before the boat. This is James and Archie Campbell, uh, my great great grandfather, and his and his son, uh, who was my great 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 uncle, uh, at the um, Glen Road Kapokanui House. You'd recognise it from the earlier picture. Oh no, this is actually the Harborough one. They like that style with the veranda, and they tell the story of how they were. Free Church of Scotland dissenters who were turned off their croft uh, for being for being Presbyterian schismatics, and so they jumped on the boat and came to find freedom, happiness, and prosperity in Dunedin, and then up into Taranaki. I grew up in that. There you have your future rural sociologist, very fine pair of pants, I've got to say. My mother addressed me on that particular day. Uh, that's on a. The family, this is the family farm I visited, my grandparents' original family farm in Hawke's Bay in 1968. How we deal with that history is difficult. As Australian anthropologist Deborah Rose has argued, when you take someone else's land and destroy their environment, mythologizing yourself in your own history becomes incredibly hard because New World settler societies loosen moral accountability from the powerful constraints of place and time. And in detaching people from continuity and place, they also loosen people from the feedback of time. Detached from organized moral accountability in two of the most fundamental domains of human life, new world settler societies generate catastrophe. Yeah, Deborah Rose's argument is a very compelling one. Uh, she argues that there's something peculiar about settler societies. Arriving, aspiring to start new lives and leave our past behind, we simultaneously have to forget our past we've left behind, or we want to forget that past we left behind and the circumstances that drove us to migrate, but we also have to forget or invisibilise the people whose land we've just taken. And she names Australia, America, Canada and New Zealand. We're a place where a reckoning is happening. And so she, she concludes, our generations alive today may be the first wave of settlers to try and grasp the enormity of conquest and to understand it as a continuous process. In consequence, many of us really search to understand how we may inscribe back into the world a moral presence for ourselves. And I think New Zealand is not a long way. I'll return to this point later in the talk. So how do Pakia farmers respond to any voices speaking back into that silence? And the answer is at the moment, for many of them, not well. It's easy to see how trigger triggering it is for some Pakeha farmers when faced with any Maori claim to land or legitimacy. And I must say, in terms of research we've done, it's, it's yeah, it's just a little chagrinning that a lot of the farmers that are pursuing progressive and alternative farming systems, a number of them really do still retain a significant blind spot when it comes to Maori claims, practices and frameworks. Even the ones who are articulating how their new systems are reconnecting the landscape, are breaking through modernist boundaries and the like, really then struggle to relate that back to older practices of land use that used to exist in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So it seems that after the 1960s, as Sir Tippany said, once the assimilation project failed, and Maori began to reassert their political rights and their land rights and their identity, the response for many people is to simply respond to resort to some kind of historical terra nullius, just to pretend that the other hasn't actually been there and doesn't actually have any need to return. The third silence is much more complicated and I really can't do justice to it today, but it's a subject of um, a book I recently published, 
about the modernist farm in New Zealand. And I don't think we've spent enough time considering the shape and consequences of the very specific kind of farming that uh, became dominant in Aotearoa New Zealand through the 20th century. It's specifically pastoral farming. There were many alternatives, but instead we became an empire of grass for a number of particular historical reasons. And we became an empire of grass that was utterly dominant geographically, economically, and politically by the 1950s. That dominance was expressed through an incredibly strong relationship between farming, the state, and science institutions funded by the state. There was incredibly strong dynamics towards convergence, towards homogenization, and towards standardization in terms of our farming rationalities. And as um, Tom Brooking and Eric Pawson argue in Seeds of Empire in 2011, that after the grasslands revolution in the 1920s, a massive and state coordinated convergence takes place. Everything starts to align around a one size fits all farming pattern for the landscape in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So if I just go briefly through those, the modernization of the farm and its consequences, really can't do much justice to it. I just want to briefly go through some of the key trajectories of that modernization. As Peter Holland argues in Home in the Howling Wilderness, something happens. Um, by between the 1880s and 1920s, as this very much more experimental, much more diverse, uh, much more engagement between Pakeha and Maori land users. Um, farmers were much more experimental out at, uh, in particular, economic, ecological frontiers. They were doing some absolutely devastating things. They were doing some interesting things. But from the 1920s, this new big state science farming project starts to lock in. Uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, begins to begins to assert itself. We start to see the publication of the brochures, the pamphlets, the creation of the second, uh, well, the first land-based university, but the second agricultural college, which creates a standardized curriculum around what farming should know. And you start to see the creation of what uh, Smallfield uh, described as the grasslands revolution in New Zealand, that frankly brilliant set of scientific innovations that stabilized the utter ecological chaos that had been unleashed by um, co farming colonization in New Zealand through the 1920s. And the chief cheerleader of this particular standardization and convergence movement was the great uh, farming and research leader, Sir Bruce Levy, uh, who in writing in Grasslands of New Zealand sets out this vision that the model has been found, uh, which will succeed for the New Zealand landscape. And all that remains now is to elaborate that model to the farthest parts of the country geographically that we can possibly do. That standardization and convergence uh, results with massive state investment in science, which uh, becomes the foundation stones of the um, the coherent and uh, and um, knowable agricultural science of New Zealand. It's, it starts in laboratories. Uh, it's the grasslands division of the DSIR and various other places. Uh, it becomes uh, embedded in the curricula of various universities, uh, and it essentially uh, under, underpins our claim to have the best agricultural science in the world, best agricultural science of a very particular type. But it also has consequences. It has very, very significant consequences when seen through a sociological lens. It's a very narrow world. It's looking at one kind of farming mainly. It's looking at one set of solutions or approaches or rationalities for that farming, something that we've been trying to break out of for 50 years ever since this model really fell apart in the early 70s. It's sociologically, it's demographically incredibly homogenous. So I just borrowed this slide of, uh, of a friend and colleague at uh, Lincoln University that was presented to a particular group recent, recently, quoting um, the founding director of uh, Lincoln College. Mr. Ivy, I take it that the aim of the agricultural school is to train those sons of colonists who intended to follow the call of the farmer. And as my colleague said, uh, reflects the values of that age, the sons of colonists did not include women, nor was there room for Maori landowners, which may just be uh, a sign of the times back then. Pondering this recent, about 10 years ago, I was at a talk at Ruakura, I was at a workshop at Ruakura, and I wandered down a particular corridor and found the uh, Hall of Fame of the McMeekin Award. All worthy uh, people, dedicated scientists that since 1974 has been uh, awarded to the leading animal scientist by the New Zealand Society of Animal Production in New Zealand. 35, there was somewhere between 35 and 40 photographs along that wall, beautiful black and white photographs. And there's something for a sociologist very interesting about them. 
I'm hoping the Mimimi Eakin Award has got slightly woke since uh, I was there in 2011, but literally, it's a parade of guys. Yeah. It, it just seems that in the Venn diagram of a very homogenous world of male Pakeha culture through the mid 20th century, and the Venn diagram of what people wanted to do in agricultural science, there's a huge amount of overlap. They're not identical, but there's a huge amount of overlap. And I think that's a part of our history we don't really feel entirely comfortable sometimes admitting. The second thing that happened in the modernization of the farm was that farms really start to become, in the words of um, uh, other academics around the world and other scholars, they become machines that produce. Become, they, they develop a particular ontological feel to them where they get this machine-like character. And this is the core argument of Miguel Altieri, um, Deborah Fitzgerald, uh, multiple other people in terms of their critique of the what, what Deborah Fitzgerald calls the industrial ideal in American agriculture, is that we increasingly start to think equate the science of farming and the economics of farming with this idea of farms as machines. I think it's very, very true in New Zealand as well. Um, it gets locked in in a whole range of ways. It's not a particularly original insight. It's an important insight. It's not an original insight of mine, but I, I bring it up there to say I think it's important. The thing that I am more personally interested in, and the thing I write about in my book, is how our farms as modernist farms began to develop hard boundaries. The modernist farm, this is of course a scene from the piano, Jane Campion's brilliant movie in which there's Sam Neill up there focusing entirely on getting his fence lines into that nearly cleared bush while drama is happening back at the piano lessons at the hut. Those boundaries are an incredibly important metaphor in uh, Jane Campion's uh, film. I can't go into this in any depth, having, having this, this is where I had a book length project and I, I thought to myself when I was preparing this talk, if I go into every single one of these reasons why I think we ended up with a really tight boundary around our farms, we'll be here until three o'clock. The story basically rolls that the particular British uh, settlers that arrived in Britain during their time of family farm colonization arrived from a Britain that was just at the end of the enclosure movement or at the tail end of the enclosure movement when a massive revisioning of what a farm was as private property in Britain was happening. And a lot of the people who had enough capital to come to New Zealand from Britain came from those newly private property and stated enclosed farms. They brought it to New Zealand. It's what they wanted to do. We had a massive process of surveying the land during colonization to create hard surveying boundaries and legal title. We formalized the terms of of real estate in New Zealand in one of the clauses of the Treaty of Waitangi was the state preemption, the Crown preemption clause, establishing exactly how surveyed land was to be sold between Māori and Pākehā. The creation of those hard boundaries created farms as a little piece of privately owned, a little piece of privately owned capital. It created the, the basis around the markets for land. It created the basis around people like my forebears. Some of them arrived without very much, and that farm became a piece of capital that massively increased in value and made us much, much wealthier as the generations passed. Uh, as Brooking and Pawson argue, our farms had a weird boundary at the farm gate in terms of most of the 20th century. Where did our stock go? They experienced what, uh, what uh, Eric Pawson calls the silence of markets. I remember it as, as well growing up on the farm. The lambs went in the truck and they drove off somewhere to the works, after the works to Britain. I don't know, somewhere. But we had this weird kind of cut off sense of that, that we've struggled with throughout uh, sort of the economics of farming in New Zealand. We don't like thinking beyond the boundary of the farm gate in terms of where our product goes. There's a lot of complicated work that goes on during colonization that begins to culturally enact what feels like the interior, the owned space inside the farm boundary versus the exterior, someone else's place, the wilderness out there or nature inside and outside that farm boundary, I think is incredibly important. And ecologically, as we farm the land, as we clear bush, as we dig and we drain, we begin to ecologically work, as Bill Quonon argued in his masterwork, Changes in the Land, inside and outside the farm boundary, ecological effects start to lodge. They can't entirely be separated from each other, but they definitely begin to shape that. And the pursuit of, the pursuit of good science, funded by the state in support of this new style of farming, itself enacted this boundary. Part of being a good scientist was to think within this bounded system or this bounded machine. Move on. There's another boundary. 
So that's an artist's uh, rendition of our farm, the farm that I grew up having the most to do with, Windsor Lodge in Narawahia. And our farm really was amazingly uh, absent of history. I know the year it was bought. I know the year it was sold. But it wasn't until after that farm was sold and I became an academic many years later that I began to ponder the fact that I just do nothing about the history of our farm. What piece of land was that? It's that rural sociologist again with his flash trousers. There's an incredibly important boundary on Pākehā farms that separate the past from the present. So quoting, alongside the erasing of past owners and users of our land, another site of erasure was our landscape ecology. The paddocks were grass where previously they'd been covered in groves of kaikatea. The wetlands that once supported flax, fish and waterfowl have been drained and their remnant contained in two small fenced off areas, the swamps outside the fenced pasture at the back of the farm. The political character of this history of erasure, which had magically rendered invisible prior owners, indigenous claims and indigenous ecologies, was reproduced in our daily lives and actions. We were effectively farming inside invisible worlds, or looked at a little less charitably, we were able to farm peacefully and successfully precisely because other worlds had become invisible. Having got those three silences out there, let's finish with decolonization. How do I respond to those three silences? And I think this is our challenge. The challenge of opening up a discussion of diverse and inclusive farming history in New Zealand. The challenge of the, challenge, the ways in which we can challenge the implicitly modernist ontology of farming in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that became our norm. But also the question that if farms were key agents of colonization, actually, how about farms becoming agents and sites of decolonization? How about making them sites where hopeful things happen? So I think in terms of the first one of those challenges, hopefully the great nurturing that's underway of Maori students and junior scholars includes a few with an interest in Maori farming history, because there's a story that's waiting to be told. Those big successful Maori land trusts and, and land incorporations that are undergoing a major surge and are so successful at the moment, they didn't spring out of thin air, although our current historical narratives make it seem that way. Well, we're nurturing a generation of Maori scholars, young Maori scholars, to start rewriting that history. Uh, there's a group of Pākehā scholars that are, um, all, uh, are coalescing around this idea of going back into our own family farm histories and trying to rethink them, re-theorise them and rewrite them if we understand explicitly the colonising and the treaty-based nature of relationships that are there. So Avril Bell, uh, who's recently retired from sociology at Auckland, uh, organised a special issue in which a number of us, myself, Carolyn Morris, my, my cousin, uh, Willie Covers, uh, got to write about our family farms explicitly in terms of the way in which they reveal the colonising history of New Zealand. And that's been most powerful experience. And Richard Shaw's remarkable and readable book about his family growing up on farms on, on the coast, in, on the Taranaki coast, and, and, and only understanding years later that his grandfather had been one of the constabulary that had gone in in the sack of Parihaka. The second decolonising process we're going through at the moment is we're trying to think of a new ontology of farming. We're trying to enact a new ontology of farming. I've written a book about it, so I can't talk about it really much here just other than to make a few kind of Gnostic and mysterious sounding statements. Uh, I think really the question that I'm posing in the book is, at the end of the book is, what does a farm look like when it isn't organised around a machine-like interior with a hard exterior boundary? What kind of science do we need when we move beyond a sole focus on productivity, convergence, standardization and control, all tucked inside the hard boundaries of a farm? And part of my answer that I'm proposing in my book is that we start by making visible the invisible worlds. We have to revisibilize the social and ecological connectivity that locates our farms and wider landscapes and social worlds. And I try and uh, ask the question is, what are the things that have actually acted in ways that puncture or overflow or circumvent those modernist boundaries that have locked us into one particular kind of land use? The third and final thing I want to say about decolonization is ask us questions about how can farms act to decolonize? There's some lovely photographs of some field days and farms where there's been absolutely magnificent bush restoration, which I think is one of the ways in which for a lot of Pākehā farmers, this seems to be the first step back into decolonising our landscape, is working out how to start to relive again with Indigenous ecologies and how to reintegrate our farmscapes 
particularly this farm, it's the Munro's farm at, uh, in Southland, where they've just created this magnificent wetland, reconnecting their farm out into a wider wetland ecosystem. Um, I tell a little story in the book about uh, a battle that went on for some years between my mother and my grandfather about her plan to create a wetland restoration project in the front paddock of our farm within sight of State Highway 1, which just caused my grandfather to have conniptions. Um, this is a picture that was taken off the little wetland after it had just been put in in 1984. And while I was writing book, I sent the book, I sent a friend back to lean over the fence and take a photograph now, 35 years later. 36 years later. He didn't quite get the right angle, but that whole wetland had become this huge flourishing uh, bush regrowth. Waikato trees, they really like to have wet feet and man, did they come back. I think the final place I have to acknowledge before signing off, the most inspiring way in which farms are now acting to decolonize the landscape are happening with Maori land and with Maori land trusts. There are really remarkable things happening at places like the Tuaropaki Trust, uh, if you look into, if you talk to and read about and read the website of the Tua Ropaki Trust up in between Taupo and Rotorua, you know, when they talk about kaitiaki tanga, you know, in terms of ways of sustainably producing food or manaki tanga, nurturing community or whanauna tanga, in terms of nurturing connection and recognising relationality, it's it's a manifesto for decolonising your land use or de breaking open the straitjackets the modernist farming left on your landscape. Uh, I think the Wakatu Incorporation uh, in Nelson is uh, an inspiration example of, of putting that they've, they've broken it down even further in terms of their five long term goals. How different does your land management look when you're servicing, serving the needs of a community first and you're building a 500 year plan for how that land is going to be with you and nurture you. It's uh, a magnificently different ontology of land. For those of you who haven't seen the uh, Tapuni Kokiri, the Chapman Trip reports that they're being commissioned by Tapuni Kokiri now about the size of this new Maori land economy, it's way bigger than people. I know people have disputed some part of those uh, figures, but it's way bigger than people uh, are recognizing. So those are my three observations in terms of decolonization. Those are my three challenges to try and speak into those silences to try and open up a more diverse or inclusive farming history in New Zealand, to work out how to challenge the implicitly modernist ontology of farming in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and to think about the ways in which farms themselves become sites of decolonization. In recognition of the group I'm talking to, I just want to give you a little takeaway message for landscape architects. I think that what's happening in the decolonial turn is that we are testing the limits and boundaries of the modernist farm the thing that's utterly dominated our landscape for 100 years. We're moving away from land use defined by a single unit. The farm, the family farm, the Pākehā farm, the pastoral farm, the bounded machine-like farm, and moving back towards a focus on landscape and connectivity. So away from the farm unit and towards the land, whenua, and its connectivity, its intrinsic connectivity. And I just want to recognise that we have just, we have come such a huge distance from what in the 1960s was seen as the Maori land problem to really a, an exciting point where we are now starting to see the Maori land answer. And that really deserves, um, that just deserves to be celebrated and embraced. And at our universities, particularly the ones, maybe even the one that gave me my first job many years ago, particularly those that participated in shaping and embedding the old farm landscape ontology, I think it's the universities that need to grasp the scope and scale of this moment. And that takes me to 10 minutes to two and time to say thank you. Thank you very much.